Thanks for tuning in to Things That Matter. On today's episode, I interview author Larry Taunton, who wrote the book on the faith of Christopher Hitchens. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm here in the studio with uh, Larry Alex Taunton, and Larry is the author of a really great book called The Faith of Christopher Hitchens. And Larry, I read that book, I think shortly after it came out. Um, so that's maybe, what, a year ago, year No, and that's, a half? that's about eight months ago. Oh, it's only been eight yeah. months, okay. Tells you how I think of time, but uh, <laughs> okay. But anyway, I just, uh, I, you know, I'd always had kind of a funny sort of a liken to Christopher Hitchens, even though he was such an honorary guy, you know, I, he was a brilliant guy. He was witty, you know, I, so I liked all that. So I, I saw this book and I thought, man, I want to read this. And I could not put that thing down. I literally, I read it in a, I think an evening. I just sat and read it. Then I told my wife, you got to read this book. So I appreciate that. And um, it's just so great to have you with us. It's great for you uh, to be here and for me to be able to just chat with you for a few minutes. Well, today. it's uh, been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great, great. So just, so you wrote the book eight months ago. It came out. Um, I wrote the book years ago. You wrote the book years ago. Okay, it was it came out, but, uh, and there's been all kinds of responses to it. Different mm -hmm. kinds of responses. People like myself have loved it, and uh, I think a lot of Christians, of course, have really enjoyed it. I think pe people in the secular world have enjoyed it as well. Uh, but there's been some people that uh, kind of took it as an opportunity to beat on you. I've seen you yeah. getting beat up on social media and things like that. So, so how's it going since you wrote the book? Well, you know, uh, uh, Brian, it's interesting. Uh, you're so right. Um, the book came out to um, uh, lavish praise, um, mm -hmm. much to my surprise. You know, when you write a book, you're just hoping it gets noticed. And yeah. uh, uh, you don't have any control over that. And uh, uh, my first book, by contrast, just didn't even get noticed. Yeah. Uh, this book did. And, uh, and I was enjoying so much um, secular and Christian praise in the book. You may have heard me joke that, you know, I thought, well, I guess you can be as a Christian loved by the world. And, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then everything, you know, moved in a slightly or some things moved in a slightly different direction when a religious news service put out a tweet saying that I had claimed that Christopher Hitchens uh, converted on his deathbed. They later retracted that tweet because I make no such claim in the book. Right. But that led to yeah. many of the new atheists um, to begin, um, you know, attacking me in places uh, like uh, the uh, uh, the Guardian and uh, the Atlantic and the yeah. New Yorker and yeah. BBC and so yeah. forth. Yeah, places where you would expect the, really. the places you would expect <laughs> to be attacked from. Yeah, yeah. But so here we are, eight months later. Um, how's how's the book doing now? And is there still uh, talk out there? Are you still getting contacted by different you know groups or? publication saying, hey, we want to ask you about yeah, this. In, in, in fact, um, uh, there will be an article next month in First Things uh, in First about Things, yeah. Great. the book, which and also dealing with some of the controversy associated with the book. But yes, the book has done very well, and, uh, and it has received lavish reviews, as I say, from... Uh, uh, from the London Times and uh, from Chris Matthews on yeah, MSNBC, yeah. Yeah, uh, which you'll good. be familiar with, yeah. and uh, the Wall Street Journal and uh, and others, and so uh, that's that's really exciting to see because I wrote the book, Brian, really to try to provide a roadmap for believers as well as unbelievers to to yeah. to have relationship yeah. in a culture that's so deeply yeah. factionalized. How how are we able? Yeah. To even have a conversation, if yeah. um, if you're on one side and I'm on the other, well, yeah. here was Christopher, as I say, a Molotov cocktail tossing, you know, atheist, yeah. a man who made his living, at least in part, as a professional atheist, yeah. and I, in uh, in in good measure, as a professional Christian, if we can put it that way, and yet the two mm -hmm. of us enjoyed yeah. a warm friendship. Yeah, and to me, that was one of the really valuable aspects of the book to show that just you know because you have these radical different world views, it doesn't mean you have to be hostile toward one another. No. It, you can actually have a, a friendship. And I think the, the book brought that out beautifully where you just, uh, it, se it seems to me like in reading it, you know, you, of course, ultimately you wanted to share your faith with them. You were looking for those opportunities, but you, uh, but it, you were just also willing to be a friend to him. And I think, you know, he probably 
saw that you weren't trying to, you know, make him a, like a, a prize, you know, like, yeah. you know, I got, I got the prize, I got the atheist, but you were just loving him as a person. Yeah, I, I think, Brian, it's, um, it's interesting to me, given my relationship with uh, some very prominent atheists, whether it's um, Christopher Hitchens or, or uh, a Peter Singer or a Richard Dawkins, um, um, some others, that there are those Christians who their own children may not know Jesus Christ, but they are ready to go and share the gospel with these individuals. Yeah. Uh, or maybe their own neighbors don't know Christ, but they're ready to go yeah. forth because they see this as a as a scalp to put on their uh, yeah. you know their their, <laughs> their belt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I never saw Christopher in in that way. I I was brought together with him professionally. Originally, I saw Christopher really as an opponent to be taken down. Yeah. He was saying things that I didn't like, um, that I saw a lot of young people buying into. I saw him and, uh, and other members of, uh, of the so-called Four Horsemen of the yeah. Counter-Apocalypse, as they, they call themselves, um, saying things that a lot of young people were buying into. So I, I, I saw this as very dangerous. Yeah. But then I met him away from the stage. And, uh, and I liked him. And then I was brought together with him again and again yeah. and again. And uh, over the course of that time, a, a friendship grew between us. I found that he was different off stage than he was on mm. it. Yeah. And uh, by then, I'm not suggesting he was a hypocrite. Rather, I'm suggesting that Christopher was a consummate showman. Yeah. Sure. I mean, he had something of the actor yeah, uh, yeah. about him. I mean, he took pride in this. Yeah. Um, his, the, the way he, you know, his delivery and uh, yeah. uh, sometimes exaggerating his English accent. He, he told me that he would deliberately do that with American <laughs> audiences because he knew the effect that it yeah, had on yeah. them. Right. And uh, in his turn of phrase, and you would think the guy, if you saw him, you would think the guy across the stage that he is debating, he must want to kill that guy. Yeah. And what you didn't know about Christopher is that Christopher, not in every instance, but following my debate with him in uh, Montana, he crosses the stage to shake my hand and says, you were quite good tonight. Um, I assume we're still having dinner. Let's, yeah. let's have dinner. Yeah. And um, Christopher, you would have dinner with him for hours. Yeah. And uh, you would finally be saying, Christopher, you know, I need to go to bed. <laughs> right. Yeah. He was just getting going. He was just getting going. <laughs> I remember reading some of that in the book. You know, um, the I actually, uh, on a Sunday morning, I was teaching uh, a while back, and I, I actually read uh, probably a page and a half at least from the book. And that, that one part, I think, to me, um, this was the climactic moment in the book, and it's when you guys were on the road, and he was reading the Gospel of John to yeah. you with his uh, Johnny, <laughs> Johnny Walker, Walker there. And I, I did the picture, which is classic. And I just, I loved it. But then as he got to that, um, you know, passage, and uh, he read about Jesus being the resurrection and the life, and you said to him, uh, or he said to you, do you, you know, uh, Larry Alex Taunton, do you believe that Jesus, you know, and you said, well, you know I believe that. But my question to you, Christopher, is do you believe it? And his response was something to the effect that it was very appealing to a man in his condition. Position. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, those those scenes were wonderful scenes. I, yeah. I had Christopher almost if his his condition was 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 worsening, but uh, I had uh, come up with the idea of having Christopher read yeah. the New Testament, the yeah. whole New Testament, yeah. and that we would put it on iTunes. Yeah. Because I thought, wouldn't that be wonderful to have Chris? Because he had a voice, as oh, I say in the book, like, yeah. like, Chris, like uh, excuse me, Richard Burton. Yeah. And uh, so it, it was a funny scene, the two of us driving through the Shenandoah Valley, and he has, you're, you're right, that Johnny Walker black label squeezed between his knees, yeah. um, a cigarette. Yeah. And uh, his reading glasses on the end of his nose. And in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I think I even stopped him at one point and said, Christopher, are are you as blown away by this whole scene as I am yeah. right now? I mean, yeah. here I am, the uh, you know the the evangelical, uh, non drinking guy, you know, driving yeah, driving sure, through yeah. the Shenandoah, and there you are reading for the yeah. Bible, and we we both laughed at the irony of it all. <laughs> you were the designated driver. I was the designated driver. <laughs> <laughs> so you you published the book, it came out, all kinds of excitement around it, and then something really unexpected happened yes. to you. You got to know. Uh, yes. Accident that almost took your life. Yes, I was uh, I was hit by a car while cycling. Um, 
Uh, Lawrence Krauss wasn't driving it, um, the, uh, the new atheist, uh, I, uh, I, though I had my suspicions yeah. for a time. But yes, I was hit by a car and it broke my neck in three places, mm. my back in four, my, all my ribs on the right side of my body, split my jaw, skull fracture, mm. facial reconstructive um, surgery, and uh, 23 bones and all. And um, the book, I just handed in the manuscript. Mm. And then here I am, um, Brian, I'm in uh, an ICU fighting for my life. Mm. Uh, a very unexpected indeed. Wow. Oh, so the book hadn't even been, no. it come out yet? Oh, no, my it was, it, the book would come out six months later. Right, okay, because it was 13 months ago that That's that right. happened, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah, it's amazing because you, you just look really sturdy and healthy. <laughs> well, I, uh, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> um, I, am, uh, I used to say that I, I feel a little bit like, you know, very thin glass. Yeah. Uh, I've improved. Um, I, uh, I lost um, 30 plus pounds just mm -hmm. within, yeah. uh, gosh, within about six weeks mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you're just laying in a bed and, uh, yeah. and not moving. But, you know, the Lord has taught me some uh, really rich and powerful things. And while I would never want to go through that again, it was, mm -hmm. it was truly awful. Yeah. Um, and it continues to some extent, but to, yeah. to a much, much um, less... Yeah degree, yeah. but I would never trade the things I've learned. Right, yeah. And and so you not only, you know, have uh, written on this this topic with Christopher, uh, not only has your uh, organization hosted debates, but you you're, you actually do debates. You engage oh, in yes. debates as well. That's right. I uh, debated Daniel Dennett mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Zaid Shakir, a very prominent Muslim on Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. I've debated Christopher Hitchens, and uh, I've offstage have, have gone around many times with with Richard Dawkins and uh, debated uh, Michael Shermer and mm -hmm. and some others. So yes, mm -hmm. um, very much so. And and so in some ways, you just from our earlier conversation, you you see some almost providential thing with the accident, which led to some real suffering, which is an issue that always comes up in these conversations with the atheist. Yes. If there's a God who's a God of love, why is there suffering in the world? Or why does he allow people to go through these things? And now you have gone through something that uh, you can speak to that, not just theoretically. Mm -hmm. it, you can speak to it from life Yes, um, I will tell you that when I went on stage to debate Christopher Hitchens, was the, which was the first big debate that I did, which was in 2010, if um, there was an area that I felt vulnerable, it mm -hmm. was the issue of suffering. Now, the Lord decided to uh, shore that up just a little bit. I'd have preferred that he just hey. send me a book. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but it concentrates your thinking when you're suffering. It concentrates you on the eternal questions, the big questions, the way nothing else can. Yeah. And in the wee hours of the, uh, of the night, um, which were the hardest for me. It's when everyone is asleep and you feel mm -hmm. uh, pain is lonely. It's deeply lonely, whether it's emotional or physical. And the kind of physical pain that I suffer brings with it, which I didn't know before this, deep emotional suffering mm -hmm. because there's a lot of questioning that you go through. Will I ever be myself again? Will I ever be, to do, be able to do the things that I previously did um, uh, again? And I found myself in uh, those times where, you know, I can't sleep. I'm smashed, mm, yeah. just smashed. And on my one arm that's working, I'm, I'm looking through passages of Scripture, mm -hmm. and I'm seeking something that I can hold on to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are, those are moments you find. Uh, I've, I've lived with some chronic illness for many years, and, uh, you know, thank God these days I'm actually, you know, feeling quite well. But... Um, there are times where you just, you know, you know there's a God, but you just don't feel him. Mm -hmm. And you long to hear a word from him, and it's, uh, you know, silent. Yes. And you, re you realize, though, uh, maybe you had this experience, the Psalms would be such a comfort to me because I would find that the psalmist was in a similar yes. situation yes. many times. Well, well David, speaking of being in a pit, yeah. um, is certainly something um, that I can relate to and how his, his weeping turned to rejoicing. Yeah. And... Yeah. Uh, uh, that I can certainly identify with. And I, I would say to any who are watching us, um, one of the things that I've learned is that God is with us even when he's not healing us. Yeah. He's, he's no less with us. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there is this, this sometimes the feeling that, you know, hey, there's this person over here who's had a remarkable recovery. Yeah. 
But what about me? What about me? Yeah. Uh, well, he's with you mm -hmm. in, in, in that. And his purposes sometimes are very opaque yeah. um, to us in, uh, in our suffering. I, for me, uh, in spite of all my suffering, um, there were really remarkable and truly miraculous elements. I lost um, uh, half of my total blood volume. I never had to go on a ventilator, never lost consciousness. Mm. Wow. Um, my physicians thought my survival was a miracle, and I really attribute this to not only good medical care, but um, but to the prayers of, yeah. of, of many and the Lord's uh, uh, providence in my life, and that he spared me for a purpose. And, uh, and it fills me with a unique sense yeah. of mission yeah. when you know, when you believe, as, as the two of us do, yeah. that... He could have taken my life, but sure. he chose not to. Yeah. He, he chose not to, and I think that's for a reason. Yeah, you're here for a purpose. For a that's purpose. Right. Yeah. So, um, on a weekly basis, I do a little um, uh, program called Things That Matter. And so, um, I just like to ask people, you know, about, hey, well, you know, what really matters? Or, and what I mean by that is like, you know, kind of, you know, what's just kind of on the top of your head or kind of in your heart right now that you're just passionate about or something you see? the Lord speaking to you or, or something like that. Is there, is there anything? Well, we've just come through a presidential election. Yes. Uh, there's riots, you know, yeah. um, around our country and there's deep fear on all sides. And um, I really, th it's something that I feel very strongly and passionate about, Brian, is, and I've written two articles just in the last week for the American Spectator on this topic as well as in Fox News. And that is this, that, um, that Christians... While they certainly need to participate in the electoral process, I'm, please don't understand me as saying that you shouldn't vote. But they can't put the whole of their hope in that yeah. process. Yeah. Um, we need to return to a very old strategy if we wish to change this country. And that strategy is called the Great Commission. Yeah. Um, I think that for too long, evangelicals have sought political solutions to spiritual problems. Yeah. And that just is never going to work. Yeah. Um, and um, I would just want to encourage um, the Christians in this country. Evangelicals alone are 26% of the population. Brian, I can't help but think, what would happen if those 26%, that sleeping giant that is the American church, woke up and didn't just simply go to the voting booth and then return to the bed? Yeah but really woke up to the Great Commission. Yeah. We would see a third Great Awakening in this country, and yeah. that's something I feel very passionate yeah. about. And this, this is such a unique situation because not only do you have the, the country divided as a result of the election, yes. but you have the church divided mm -hmm. as well. There, there are some Christians who think, you know, well, thank God, this is fantastic. Yeah. There are other Christians who say, Lord, what are you doing? Yeah. This doesn't make any sense to yeah. me. You know, yeah, so it's really... Yeah, well, that's right, because the hope is in the gospel. Well, it certainly is. And I just think, you know, I just saw a recent poll that 81% of evangelicals voted for Trump. Yeah. I mean, just imagine what 81% of people could do if yeah. they did something <laughs> that wasn't strictly political. Yeah, something greater. Something something more important. Yeah, right. And uh, that means sharing the gospel with our neighbors yeah. and, um, and not bringing... Um, a big, heavy political baggage, but yeah. rather bringing the hope of yeah. the gospel, the eternal hope of yeah. the gospel. Yeah. Larry, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right. God Enjoy bless you. It. All right. Thank you.